I couldn't throw it out I had to scream and shout Before I turned to dust I've got to throw it out Before I turned to dust Hello, Sally Libby. Hello, Michael Small. Here we are. It's the second episode of our podcast, which goes by the name, I Couldn't Throw It Out. So I'm going to tell you a story or two about some very important objects, and you're supposed to inspire me to throw them out, which brings us to our first spoiler. I thought your mother was the first spoiler. Why, I oughta. <laughs> Actually, that's good. The puns are flowing early today. Maybe you'll get them out of your system. <laughs> the actual spoiler is this. There is no way I will ever, ever throw out the objects I'm sharing with you today. I am taking them with me right into the cremation fire because these treasures are a perfect record of one of the very best days of my life when one of my craziest wishes came true. To give you a hint, I want to start by reading to you. Hold on. Let me get settled in my crib. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt you'll find this settling. Here goes. In the land of mass frustration, the judges are sleeping, counting woolly little lawyers and grinding their teeth. Outside my sleepless window, the Hollywood sirens are shrieking, while down a searchlit alley runs some lost belief. Wow, that's some image. A belief getting cornered in an alley like a criminal. Yes, and what about those judges who are counting woolly little lawyers instead of counting sheep? And the fact that the window is sleepless, not the person looking out of it. Don't tell me you wrote this. Are you kidding? No way. It's an excerpt from The Windfall, a song on 1991 album called Night Ride Home. It has a highly unusual melody and equally unexpected tuning. It's written and performed by Joni Mitchell. Really? It sounds so different from the Joni I remember. But it isn't. It, it actually fits her pattern from the very start. And this explains why I really want to tell you about these treasures that I extracted from one of my storage boxes a few weeks ago. Here they are, stacked on my desk. Four 90-minute cassette tapes in mm. clear plastic cases which contained my full People Magazine interview in 1985 with Joni Mitchell, plus a thick type transcript in a folder. And it's marked with one word in big orange letters. It says, Joni. That's quite a haul. Why do I have a feeling that there's a tale behind it? Oh, there always is. And this one began on February 28th, 1972, the winter of our discontented ninth grade. You remember the exact date? Of course not. I found a hint on the interwebs. On that fateful day, I was lucky enough to walk down our high school hallway and see Dean Folsom. He was so cool. It was like he was in ninth grade going on grad school in philosophy. Well, Dean, <laughs> Dean had an even older, cooler sister who had an extra ticket to a concert at the Music Hall in Boston. So Dean offered it to me. He told me that the concert was by Joni Mitchell and Jackson Brown. Ooh. Now, on the scale of ninth graders in Topsfield, Massachusetts, I saw myself as kind of sophisticated, <laughs> except that I didn't know the difference between Jackson Brown and James Brown. What? I thought I thought I was going to a soul concert. A nerd. <laughs> Luckily, I was the youngest child, so my parents had totally given up on discipline. They said... You're 15 and you want to drive to a concert in the city with two teenagers we've never met? Go, enjoy! <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm in the back seat, putting up Route 1 with all the neon lights and the darkness around Ooh. us. We were stardust. We were golden. <laughs> but man, when that concert started, was I ever surprised by the amount of soul displayed by Jackson Brown. Oh, I guess Papa didn't have a brand new bag. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was good, but the soul meter did not flicker. On the other hand, when Joni Mitchell came out, I was blown away. I never imagined that someone like this could even exist. Her voice was like a, like a bird song. 
it, it echoed from our velvet seats to the gold leaf on the ceiling. <laughs> and she looked like nobody else. She was wearing a floral printed pantsuit. She mm-hmm. told us she made it herself. Mm-hmm. What a cool thing to do, to, to make special clothes for us. And as she strummed the dulcimer, an instrument I'd never even heard of, <laughs> her straight blonde hair hung down over her face. She was so intense and so cheerful at the same time. Right away, I loved her music more than anything. I wanted to hear that sound for the rest of my life, which is how we get to my Aunt Evelyn. She was the follow-up act? Well, she followed up with a birthday present, the one I most wanted, Joni's Blue Album. I played that record every day and drove my family crazy. (laughs) They hated Joni's voice. They found it piercing, strange, unpleasant. Yeah, same thing with my dad. When my sister Susan played Joni endlessly, he couldn't take it. Normally, he was composed, but he'd lash out with, turn off that noise. What was wrong with these people? (laughs) Clearly, we had to educate the masses. So I bought all of Joni's earlier albums and played them just as often, really loud. I gotta ask, you were a high school boy. Everyone else is listening to Grand Funk Railroad and Led Zeppelin. (laughs) I listened to Led Zeppelin, too. I had their second album. You got a whole lot of love. (laughs) You were a regular metalhead. I was, too, with my braces. Okay, that's pun number two. You've got one left for today. (laughs) By the way, I interviewed Jimmy Page and Robert Plant many years later. They're into Joni Mitchell, too, so there. They couldn't love her as much as you did. What was it about her that got you so obsessed? So many things. We're used to the sound now, but back then, it was shocking. All those strange tunings and close harmonies. The melodies were so complicated, they went places you never expected. But mostly, it was the words. When you repeat a Joni Mitchell lyric, it fills up your mouth. Just the way great poetry does, it feels so good to say the words. You can almost chew on them. Listen to this one. If I'd only seen through the silky veils of ardor what a killing crime this love can be, I would have locked up my heart in a golden sheath of armor and kept its crazy beating under strictest secrecy, high security. Now just humor me for a minute. Say these words, the silky veils of ardor. The silky veils of ardor. Could you feel it when you said it, the way your mouth wraps around it? You're right. You can chew on it. And Joni kept this up right until Shine, which was her last album of new songs. It came out in 2007, 15 years ago. It included her prophecy about climate change. This is what she wrote. We live in these electric scabs. These lesions once were lakes. No one knows how to shoulder the blame or learn from past mistakes? And who will come to save the day? Mighty Mouse? Superman? Bad dreams are good in the great plan. Now, see what she did at the end? She twists it. It sounds like a bit of ancient wisdom, and it's followed by this churning phrase on the piano, the sound of time rolling on, things continuing, repeating, and healing themselves. So it must have been like a national holiday for you when a new Joni Mitchell album came out. No, it was torture. What? That makes no sense. (laughs) Well, after Joni had a big hit with the Court and Spark album, she Mm. started experimenting. So I get all excited about buying the new album, and then I I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Sometimes (laughs) I had to sit with the new one for years. (laughs) Then suddenly it would open up to me. Oh, so you're a slow learner. Well, speaking of slow learning, you know I'm reading Proust right now, and I love to quote him. Don't feel obligated. You can skip it. (laughs) No, come on. I have to inflict all my obsessions on you. I just read a section that is so relevant. Proust is writing about a piece of music, really powerful music, that people couldn't absorb the first time they heard it. Listen to this. He wrote, The reason a work of genius is not easily admired at first is that the person who created it is extraordinary, unlike anyone else. So you're telling me he predicted Joni? I'm telling you 
that she was so far ahead of me that I couldn't catch up. And I wasn't alone, which didn't always work well for her career. Think about it. What's the latest Joni Mitchell song you can remember? Help me, I think I'm <laughs> falling into a bottomless pit. Uh, those, <laughs> those are not the correct lyrics, Sally. <laughs> but you made my point. That song was released in 1974, and she recorded more than a dozen albums of new music since then. Now I get why you wanted to meet her. Mm -hmm. But how did you pull it off? I can't see Joni wanting to be in People magazine. Well, it wasn't the most natural fit. <laughs> but at the time, <laughs> in 1984, Joni liked to go dancing at parties. And I covered parties for People magazine. What a coincidence. It, <laughs> it was kind of a racket. All the nightclubs had VIP rooms with food and alcohol and other illicit pleasures for celebrities. So I'd show up and write an item about who was there, which made regular people want to pay big bucks to get inside. So each night, the publicist would send me a guest list in advance. When I saw that Joni was going to be at a nightclub called Kamikaze, that was my in. Ah, so you stalked her. Sally, I did not stalk Joni. I stalked everybody. <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> so I get to the club, and there she is, as usual. She was wearing a really nice dress, and she looked beautiful. A, a little bit of odd trivia, she happened to be there with a friend who was the sister of the very beautiful model Lauren Hutton. Anyway, I went up, and I asked Joni to dance. Remember those moves you saw me do in the high school cafeteria? Oh, I wish I could forget. <laughs> well, <laughs> I used them, oh. and somehow... It made an impression. Now, I know this because of an interview Joni did 11 years later with a Canadian radio show. They reprinted part of it on JoniMitchell.com. I, I sent it to you so you could peruse it. Now I'll do the reading. Let me see. Here it is. Joni talked of meeting a writer named Michael Small. <laughs> Small told her he would like to do an in-depth interview with her for People magazine. Isn't that a contradiction in terms, Joni County? <laughs> Small said that the magazine owed him one. The only trouble, he confessed to Joni, I'm not a very good writer yet. Yes, I said that. I really did. So you took the humble route. I'll have to try that the next time I want an interview with Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> well, I wasn't <laughs> humble. I was honest. Then unfortunately, I felt I had to drive the point home which means that this is the time to jump ahead and give you a sample of my stupidity during the interview. Couldn't we start with Joni's brilliance? That, that comes later. The comparison between us makes her seem even more amazing. So here's some context. I had already been working for people for five years. I should have known what I was doing, but a genetic flaw got in the way. I'm a fool. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I was then. Around hour four, I was trying to tell Joni that I felt guilty for taking so much of her time without actually getting a story. But you'll see the pattern. Gibberish came out of my mouth, not English. The other thing that I'm a little worried about is like, am I, I mean, you haven't said anything, but like, am I keeping you too? I mean, I, this is I your really, day. okay, yeah. I just have so I, I'm going to give you like, we just decided to, you know. I think we could really do a good article. Oh, I would. I mean, you know, the other thing you should know. I mean, I have to be honest. I, you're not talking to you know Norman Mailer here. I, yeah. I'm a writer who's still learning. I don't think I'm bad. I think I'm good. But you know, I don't think with journalism that I always string together sentences brilliantly. I'm just telling you that up front because I want you to know that I'm going to do my best. You know. Oof, that's embarrassing. There are so many reasons why I cringe when I hear that. But for some reason, Joni signed up for this. After our fateful dance, she said I could interview her when she released a new album. I thought that would be soon, but unfortunately, after a year, nothing. Then she changed managers. Her new manager was Peter Asher. Does that name ring a bell with you? I'm hearing more of a gong than a bell. He was in a group called Peter and Gordon, and they had a hit called A World Without Love. Remember that? I don't care what they, they say. say I, I won't stay in a world without, without love. love. <laughs> wow, that's an oldie. <laughs> I had a single of that song when I was seven, oh. and I played it, I played it endlessly on my portable <laughs> record player. 
Do you detect a pattern? <laughs> anyway, I was excited to meet him, but unfortunately, his office did not seem equally excited about Joni in People magazine. They gave me the feeling that it would never happen. Can you imagine my dejection and disappointment? Yep. But one key detail turned things around. Joni had not forgotten me. I'd even argue that I had a subliminal effect on one of her songs on the album she recorded after meeting me. One of the songs starts like this. I'm reading people rags in the checkout lane. Look, here's a hunk, here's a honey, celebrated people and their claims to fame. Wow, that song is your claim to fame. You'll live forever. Maybe. Joni must have told Peter Asher that the interview had to happen. So finally, in 1985, I met her at his office. Nice work. When I listen to the interview now, it's a time capsule. Suddenly, I'm 28 again, and Joni is 42. A lot of water over the bridge since then for both of you. Both of us have evolved in many ways. In fact, one example may be how we started the interview. This is one of our first exchanges. Is there somebody whose music you listen to and get that that sort of feeling, you know, listening to the words and really thinking about them? And, and Do them. Blood on the Tracks, mm -hmm. I guess, was the last one that, that, you know, I really enjoyed. And some of the outtakes from the album before this uh, that I heard, for instance, this friend of mine, had, had some of the outtakes from it, and there was one image, man, that I thought was incredible. It was never released. I mean, sooner or later, it, later it'll show up on one of these collection albums, I hope, but it was, the image was, um, you think I'm sleeping, but I'm lying here like a rattlesnake watching you trample on the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's probably a paraphrase. I only heard it once, but the image of it I thought was fantastic, you know. So that's one of the last things of his that really, like, stuck in my quotation department. Right. So cool. Jody does Dylan. Do you think she changed her mind about that? Good question. There was a little controversy in 2010 when Joni seemed to be critical of Dylan in a Q&A with the LA Times, she later said that she was misunderstood. All I can say is, in my two days with Joni, she praised Dylan about four times. So you got off to a positive start. With one big challenge. Peter Asher seemed to think that a People magazine interview could be done in like mm, 30 minutes tops. <sighs> but... I was such an unfocused interviewer, and Joni was such a good talker, that when Peter came in to tell us it was quitting time, about all I had were a few random stories. I panicked. My boss had flown me to L.A., and I had nothing. Oh. Joni could see the look on my face, so when he left the room for a minute, she wrote the address of her house in Malibu on a piece of paper and slipped it to me. Then she told me to come by the next day, just after lunch. Oh, now I love her, too. You'll love her even more when you hear that she was as worried about my interview as I was. The next day, when we were talking with Larry Klein, he was her husband at the time, and he's an amazing bass player who's on many of her records, she said this. I was saying to Larry after the first leg of this, I don't know what he's going to do with this, because I'm answering you sometimes two and three times. You know what I mean? Like, the first time I'll say it, and... You know, almost the that's same way you hone it down on paper. I hear it come out and I say, no, 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 that's too loose. And then I come back around it. Maybe, maybe the third time you've got something that's fairly yeah, exactly. precise, you know. So She was so nice to my friend. Unfortunately, I made a big mistake. Before meeting Joni, I thought it was a good idea to have brunch in Santa Monica with my college roommate, Charlie. I don't know if you'll remember this, but Charlie is a very optimistic person. He always feels that any situation can turn out fine. All during brunch, I was nervous about being late for my interview. Charlie kept saying, don't worry, piece of cake. She's right up the road. Good times. <laughs> then at one point, he looked up and said, uh-oh, you'd better go fast. You're going to miss it. Uh. I raced out of there and zoomed up the Pacific Coast Highway. I got there about 20 minutes late. And guess what I see? Joni's out in the driveway waiting for me. I can't believe you made her wait for you. I guess I'm lucky that Joni was more patient with me than you are. <sighs> Let me tell you about her house. Beautiful, right? Her main place is up in the Hollywood Hills, and I didn't see that. 
This was her beach house, and man, what a location. A few houses away from Larry Hagman, who was super famous then from starring in Dallas. But Joni's house was not at all Hollywood. Simple, airy, not too big, with glass facing the ocean, her paintings on the walls. The kind of place where you walk in and feel so comfortable, totally at home. I set up my tape recorder on the coffee table, and she sat across from me. I hope you finally had your questions in order. What did you ask her? I knew I should start with her new album, Dog Eat Dog. Listening to it now, I see why she and Larry put at least five months into recording it. Joni was experimenting for the first time with synthesizers. The result is extremely intricate. Little snippets of sound woven in surprising ways into tightly stitched backing tracks. The only problem, most people just don't listen carefully enough, or they don't have the right equipment to catch all that detail. In my case, I listened on a noisy plane to an advanced cassette that Joni had dubbed for me. Of course, I didn't understand what she was doing, which led to a question I'd had for a long time. Why did she keep changing styles, making it so hard for me to keep up? Later, when we took a break and went to a local diner for dinner, she started to answer. She described her musical evolution to me. When you've been around long enough, people only remember certain facets of you with before, you know, I see Joni Mitchell, that, that folk singer from the 60s, if that's where whoever was writing the article got off. He remembers me as a 60s act. The other day I saw, you know, the confessional writing style of the 70s. You know, so different people associate me with different decades, right? I'm just living here. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm carrying this tale of history, like, around behind me, but I'm as much in the 80s as I was in the, I was there in all of them, you know what I mean? I was in the 60s. I was in the 50s as a, as a dancer. I was, I was a punk when, you know, when that was an insulting word before it was revitalized and it was, became a glamorous. We never called ourselves punks. We were called punks by... Yeah. The authorities. Right. <laughs> so I've seen the fifties come back and now the sixties are coming back. Um, but I am not I'm in the eighties. So she kept changing with the times and you couldn't. When I got a little more relaxed, I finally got to the point. Why did she leave so many of us behind with what seemed like a huge change in her style? It all started in nineteen seventy five with an album that didn't seem to fit into any genre at all. It was called The Hissing of Summer Lawns. You know, I was pretty much of a fan. And when when that album came out, I was like really pissed off. And I really did not like it. And now it's my favorite of all of them. (laughs) So take it back. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I, I can't really... I mean, that's one thing. That really hurt my feelings. After that, I kind of thought, well, I'll finish up this contract and then I'll quit. You know, it's too personal. Well, (laughs) why do you think people, why do you think people hated it? Because they liked the one before it so much. That's one possibility. I've seen that happen a lot. That, Um, That it has to do with when you really love something a lot, it sets up an expectation. You want to have, get that same feeling off, but your imagination is, is always better than reality. So when the next thing comes out, it's disappointing. But what? with, with, with hissing, you might tell me why you hated it so much. Well, first of all, at that point, I really didn't like jazz, and that I, really wasn't jazz. Though. It sounded to, to it me now, like right? it was then. Everybody said it was. You sure you weren't influenced because you were told it was jazz? To be honest, I didn't read that much. Mm -hmm. I was like, I didn't like the instrumentation that much. I wanted to hear more just piano and acoustic guitar and stuff like that. That's been one of my problems, is people who like that, they won't let me do anything else. I guess, you know, the later albums really are more experimental in general. I mean, you just started experimenting. What would you do if you got killed off? If you were loved, then hated. What would you do after that? Would you go back and to sass or would you like you know pander to them or or, or would you just say be true to yourself you know it must feel so terrible you put in so much work and you think you've done a great job and people hate it especially when the music sounds so personal 
On her early albums, she put very private emotions out there in a way that few people did before her, if any. At the time, that was very unusual. I asked her why she took that risk. Like, that kind of stuff, you don't share with people usually unless you're Joni Mitchell. And do you have, like, sort of mixed feelings about, I'm sending out my, I'm really sending out something deep upon the world. Yeah, and you do have the mixed emotions, I'll tell you. The, the reason for doing it is, you know, you're always hearing actresses, like women, especially complaining that they're no good, good roles for women. So here I have the luxury to create good roles and create deep meaning. However, the pressure of being both the writer and, so to speak, the actress for the material is double fold. On that level, you're vulnerable, you know. Um, but if you're going to do it, you, you've got to do it all, all the way in a certain way. But here's the interesting thing. When I asked Joni for the story behind some of her later songs, her response was pure fiction, storytelling. In fact, her lyrics from the start present a cast of characters who are not Joni Mitchell. A gambling dry cleaner, a stifled suburban housewife, the jilted lover Marcy, the abused little girl Cherokee Louise. I read that many of her songs are about her love affairs. Are you saying it isn't true? I'm questioning your question. A few years ago, I read a biography of Joni that infuriated me because it kept trying to tie her songs back to her romances with famous people. That totally misses the point. No matter who inspired the songs, they're about big things that apply to everyone. Now, with male singers like Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan, Elvis Costello, I don't hear constant questions about the women who inspired their songs. So why do we ask Joni? You're right. It's sexist. I apologize. Well, you don't have to be too contrite, because, of course, <laughs> I asked about it. I wanted to know, too. She, she had nothing but nice things to say about two of her most important partners, Graham Nash and the drummer John Guerin, who died in 2004. But she also told me why she hates being asked about this. You know, there was something that happened to me very I, um In the middle of all of this, this supposed... Uh, free love generation that we were, I was made, Rolling Stone sort of made a scapegoat out of me. Mm -hmm. What they did was they drew a heart in Rolling Stone mm -hmm. with a lot of, you know, they, they made a kind of a monohari out of me, you know, they mm -hmm. drew all these lines, of, old lady of the year, I think they mm -hmm. called me, and they, they, all of these lines of broken hearts, they tried to portray me like this, this kind of heartbreaker picture, and it made me very, very sensitive to mm -hmm. it, and, and and in a way, kind of responsible regarding things like that. You know, mm -hmm. like, think about it, heartbreaker. It's it's a very romantic yeah. image. They, they say that about Madonna now. And it gives her a certain <laughs> distinction in color, you know? Yeah. You know, but think about it another way, like a heartbreaker. A heart mm -hmm. is something people need. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That kind of breaks my heart. Her life is so public. Did you see the slideshow in the New York Times for the 50th anniversary of the Blue Album? I think about uh, 20 people sent it to me. That's the first time I learned that the song River was about Graham Nash. Now I wish I didn't know. It's so easy to identify with that song. We all can imagine that it's about us. And that's just what I was saying earlier. But for some reason, writers always want to connect Joni to other famous people. I made her go through a list of female vocalists and tell me what she thought of them. Side note, she said Bonnie Raitt was a good old gal mm. and Linda Ronstadt was a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Marcy, when he interviewed Joni, did the exact same thing in 1997 for an interview in Rolling Stone. He pushed her to give an opinion about Melanie and Joni sidestepped it. But the question is, why do we do this? You tell me. You worked at People magazine. I should have figured it out in a mere 16 years. <laughs> but the truth is, I never did. I just kept asking celebrities all those questions. <laughs> I'm curious about famous people because it seems like they live in a special world. I want to hear about it from the inside. It gives me something to imagine, like more exciting than daily life. Actually, when I listen again to the questions I asked Joni, 
it seems like I was looking for the flip side of that. I wanted to find an overlap between Joni's life and our less exciting lives, <laughs> a kind of validation. So I had lots of questions about what she was like in high school. Class poet. Maybe secretly, but that's one of the big surprises. Joni claims to be anti-academic. Hmm. With all her genius for lyrics, she told me several times that she hated studying poetry in school. I always hated poetry. You know, in the school system, I, you know, owed to a daffodil. And it, it, it was, there was one poem I can remember in the school system that I liked by E.J. Pratt. I can't really quote it, but I remember the imagery struck me, struck me as great. It's called The Dying Eagle. And it was about this eagle on his perch, you know, the mighty bird, seeing a plane go by and contesting it and then coming back like all kind of hunched over himself onto the perch, you know, that he was no longer king of the sky. You've been, re you've been writing that one ever since. Yeah, that's, that's the only point. And... It's like kind of, that struck me as like really profound, but most huh. of it didn't have anything to do with our lives. And, and Chuck Berry was the closest thing yeah. to a living poet. And then Dylan, of course, sprang up. Well, Joni definitely gives hope to everyone who didn't make the honor roll in high school. You flunked out senior year? I, I failed three subjects. Do you remember what three subjects they were? Mathematics, physics, I forget what the other one was. Were you, were you doing Biology. a lot of drugs then or something? Or you just weren't interested no. in your going or what? I, I used to fall asleep in school in the morning. I've always been nocturnal. And I used to lay up at night. At, at about 11 o'clock, the radio stations locally would sort of shut down, and when the hit parade would come drifting up from Texas, you know, on these bands, so I'd lie up with the radio under under the covers, and I'd say, just one more to myself, just one more, and it would be three or four in the morning. I'd still be listening to the radio. It's almost over. And I couldn't get up in the morning. You know, and I, I dragged myself over to school, but I fell asleep. It was just incredibly dull to me, you know. I'd just fall asleep, couldn't focus on it, couldn't see what it had to do with my adult life. I was just anxious to be out and traveling and seeing things firsthand. I relate to that, too. Math was nearly my undoing, but the Latin prize was mine. You did have your studious side, <laughs> but so did Joni. She was very busy in high school. You know, so when I got to high school, I did the backdrops for the school plays. I illustrated for the yearbook in the school newspaper. I, I ran a little column called Fads and Fashions. You know, like, so, you know, I was... The People magazine of... Yeah. <laughs> the People magazine so, of Saskatoon. Saskatoon. Yeah. I mean, you could get an eye for the trends, and you, you, you know... That was in the high school newspaper? Mm -hmm. That does not sound like me. It sounds like you. So many activities. Turns out that her favorite activity was dancing, which may help to explain how I met her and how I got the interview. God, you, you were fairly rebellious then, I guess. Were your parents upset? Did they... Uh... My teens were not easy on them. And I, I loved to dance. And there were two dances a week at, you know, in town. Public, well, sort of public. The YMCA, of course. I guess that was the same in this country, too. <coughs> was the weekend dance. It was a YW on Friday and a YMCA on Saturday. And there were other dances in the town, but they were kind of in forbidden territories. They'd be the equivalent to the Mud Club in New York. Yeah. Like um, the Club 400. They were dark and forbidden places. And they were, they were, you know, they were pretty wild, but I used to go to them when I was about 13. And there was no real danger, but there was a lot to look at. Night fights breaking out. And, oh. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess they're you, you could see why your parents didn't want you there, but somehow there, nothing ever happened. People protect a green kid, you know, 17-year-olds would look out for you. People yeah. look out for you when you're really young and on the street. Yeah. You know? just, I remember just living for dancing. We finally instigated a Wednesday night dance, which was a street dance in front of the YW. You know, just to, we couldn't make it to the weekend. The weekend, the weekend was <laughs> too long, you know? <laughs> You remember how we were into comedy in high school? Yes. In the senior frolics, we wrote that parody of The Exorcist. <laughs> it was a laugh riot, to us anyway. Well, this is where I found an unexpected connection to Joni. When she was in high school, she was into parody also. When I, when I was in high school, I didn't have a lot of records, like albums. 
um, I had Oscar Brown Jr. signifying, I had Lambert Henriksen Ross, the hottest new sound in jazz, which was my Beatles. I was blue and I was always wearing I knew I knew all the lyrics and you know, everything <laughs> on that. I just wore that record out. Why was it you and, and were Miles, you pre were you pre Beatles? Yeah. Oh. Beatnik. Oh. Like the, the Bohemian thing in New York coincided with my high school days. So we oh. there was a little enclave of us like you know More we, black. Yeah, leotards and mostly in a satirical kind of way. I, I don't think we really took I don't remember taking myself that serious with it. For instance, we, in high school they had a talent night, and I I recited some kind of like abstract poem in a, in a three-legged bathtub with a long black stocking and a gray, you know, like with a bongo player, and it was like an attempt to, to send up the abstraction. That's a great image, but I'm beginning to understand why our siblings say that you and I are stuck in high school. <laughs> Did you ask her about anything beyond those years? I forced myself. Mm. Here's, here's what I found out. She graduated somehow and got a job modeling in a department store. Of course she did. Those cheekbones. This is how she earned the money to go to the College of Art in Calgary, Alberta. Wait, your sister Debbie lives in Calgary. She never lit on that <laughs> it was such a hip place. Well, Joni was there 20 years earlier in 1963 and I think she might have traveled in slightly different circles than Debbie does. Uh. After doing so poorly in high school, suddenly Joni was the star of her art classes. It looked as if she'd have a career as an artist. She hadn't even thought of going into music until one day she got an instrument that she no longer plays, at least not on her album. Uh, you, was it a used ukulele or was it new? When you no, were it was new. As a matter of fact... The day that I got it, I had just had my wisdom teeth pulled, and with a mouthful of bleeding sutures, this friend of mine and I went over to, uh, it cost $36 or something. I didn't have enough money to get it. It was all I could afford. It was as close to a real guitar as I could afford. So, But you were already performing after only be playing one year with no training or anything. Mm -hmm. And after one year, you were performing. Mm -hmm. I can't. Believe that. And you were doing still like Judy Collins songs and a couple of your old songs at this point? No, I didn't have any. I hadn't. I'd been writing poetry ever since I was a child, but it was like that was private business and I hadn't put together that I, I had all these latent things. I, at, at seven and eight, I was composing on the piano, but I had been scourged by locals that was considered yeah, playing by ear. Uh, I'd been writing poetry, but I didn't like poetry particularly. <laughs> I didn't that really know what that, that one's pretty. what it was, you know. So it wasn't until Blonde on Blonde and Highway 61 Revisited that I realized, oh, here I can put all this business together. She got so good that she started writing her own songs and went to Toronto to be a performer. That's when she caught the eye of a singer and actor named Chuck Mitchell. Within a few days, they decided to get married. Then they moved to the Detroit area, which was his home turf, and they performed together, sometimes playing her songs. But something didn't go right with the marriage, and it may go back to the topic that interested me so much. And, and when I came to this country, I married into a hotbed of teachers, and my husband was um, frustrated with my lack of literacy. And at one point, I I said to Leonard Cohen, I have to read, you know. It's time. He said, oh, you don't need to read yet, because I was already writing. I'd written most of the material that was to be the first two or three albums. People couldn't put together that if you hadn't read, that you could write. In any case, Joni went to New York alone. She woke up, and it was a Chelsea morning? Yes, that's true. And she told me about her first apartment there on West 16th Street. I was very young. Mm -hmm. I wanted to pay for it. The first thing I did as an act of independence when I moved into my apartment in New York was to pay for the bedroom entirely with Ilmer's glue applied to the walls and, and <laughs> rolls of aluminum cooking foil. <laughs> I hung an American flag in the window and I decorated it all in red, white, and blue as an act of independence. <laughs> I mean, it was like my Independence Day celebration, right? Then, in 1968, she recorded her first album with David Crosby as the producer. What a 
it was, you see, I came in on the tail end of a movement. Even though I was a singer-songwriter, the term had not been coined yet, yeah. you know. So I looked to the unobservant like another Baez or another Judy Collins, and that era was already over mm -hmm. when I came into it. So record companies were not, because of the fadistic nature of the business, too keen on hiring something. Folk rock was coming along. They were signing up bands that were plugged in. Yeah. And, and uh, that's what the urge for going is about. Or originally, it was... Um, um, it's like running for a train that left the station hours ago. I've got the urge for going, but there's no place left to go. In other words, you know, what I did had become archaic. Before you even... Before I even started, practically. Except you proved that wrong, because, you know, you got tremendous following as soon as you started recording. Well, that was part of Crosby's power and insight, because David at that time was in the birds, and the birds were, you know, the hottest folk rock, they were the hottest new, new wave of that kind of act. And he was afraid that the company, in order to dress me up and make me look like what was new, were going to, like, stick a band all over that music and ruin it. So he said, I'm going to produce you, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell him I'm going to produce you, but I'm not going to produce you. You know, I'm, I'm going to take you into the studio. That way we'll keep the company off our back, and they're going to think I'm going to make a folk rock album, but in fact I'm going to just let you do what you do, because he believed in it. And anything we add, he said, will just be like, you're sitting in a sidewalk cafe and you see a girl go by in blue jeans, and after she goes by, you say, didn't that girl have a little bit of lace down the seam of her blue jeans? <laughs> That's how little we're going to add, he said. So when did she start to see life from both sides now? I did ask her about that song. She she reminded me that Judy Collins recorded it in 1967, a year before Joni released her first album. Uh, that helped to boost both of their careers. But her reaction to it surprised me. How do you feel about that song now? I mean, is that one of the things you're most proud of that you've ever done? Or is it something like, eh, why did they make such a big deal out of it? Or... Um. It's it's young work. It's not one of you know. It's not one of the things that, you know that that I'm the most pleased with. There there are things I've written that are much more satisfying, and and most of them are more obscure. <laughs> How many times do you think that song has been recorded? It seems crazy, but JoniMitchell.com lists thousands of recordings. Thousands and quite a range of people. Chet Atkins, the opera singer Kiri Tikwana, Adina Menzel, Leonard Nimoy, Frank Sinatra, <laughs> Jim Neighbors, Neil Diamond. That song touches a nerve with a lot of people. There's something profound in it. Joni thought so too when she wrote it, but then, just as you'd expect from her, she changed. I think that's a thing that happens with youth anyway, is that things strike you more frequently as profound in your 20s. Mm -hmm. You know, like, ooh, I remember I was always, you know, oh, I gotta write that down in my 20s. In my 30s, I got a little laxer, and I, I, I used to consider it news food. Like, when I when I get the impulse to go write it down and I didn't, you know, I would justify it by, well, you gotta feed something to the news. <laughs> the sacrifice, right? And in, in my 40s, you begin to think epically. If, if you say tomato, I can think of ten tomato stories, or you know, like one word symbols will trigger off any number of vignettes. This is where you, you, you become in danger of becoming a long-winded son of a gun. You know, like you know, like just taking up air of space in some bar because you, you just your files are like extensive. Extensive, yeah. Another thing I noticed from the very start. The melodies of Joni's songs seem to mimic the way our voices go up and down when we talk, and then it gets exaggerated into a melody. I thought Joni would find this to be the most brilliant observation she ever heard, which she didn't, <laughs> but she did confirm that I was right about the care she puts into her lyrics. I, I tend to think of this, my job is to, to, is to present 
a certain amount of something similar to literature. You can't really, you can't get too literary in song form, although I do push vocabulary a little bit, because I like vocabulary. I like those words. They're magical to me. They mean specifically what they mean, and sometimes a metaphor of simple words will work better, but sometimes not. Sometimes a three-syllable word is exquisite there. You know, yeah. the French use three-syllable words as common language. Yeah. Ours is getting abbreviated down and down and down to a grunt <laughs> language. <laughs> you can particularly hear it in Furry Sings the Blues from the Hijira album in 1976. It's full of crisp sounds and images. Just a gift of sound and... T- <laughs> t- See, that's what you're hearing, I think. It's just the preciousness of the way these things come to you sometimes. Like, I always think one line, oh, I was in ecstasy when it came to me. It was on Furry Sings the Blues. Mm -hmm. Like, trying to capture, you know, being a witness to an event Mm -hmm. and trying to capture in shorthand something that would be better done in another medium, for instance, with film where you could get, like, all the details in. And to condense it into language, you know, it is a gift, really, when the words come, like, the part I really liked when I got it, you know, when it was given to me, basically, because that was the feeling. It was like, oh, my God, that, it's got everything in it, you know, that you wanted. Pawn shops glitter like gold, okay. tooth caps in the gray decay. They chew the last few dollars off old Beale Street's carcass. Carrion and mercy. All these songs I've never heard of. I had no idea. So when you think of the biggest hit that Joni recorded, what song comes to mind? Pay Paradise, put up a parking lot. Well, yes, from 1970. But I was hoping you'd say Woodstock. The most famous recording of her song was by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. We all remember that. But what did you think of Joni's performance at Woodstock? I don't remember it exactly. Well, you just saved your credibility. Here's why. Did you? You didn't perform in Woodstock, right? No. But you definitely went. I mean, well, no, I didn't go either. What happened was <clears throat> the night before, CSN and I played a, a gig in Chicago. Uh-huh. It was either on a Friday or Saturday night. And Sunday night, Sunday we were in New York and we were at the airport. And we, we were about it was CSN and Elliot Roberts and David Geffen and, and myself all in the airport. And, and the, this was on Sunday, the last day of, the, of Woodstock. Following day, I was supposed to do um, the Dick Cavett show, which was then I think a morning show, and there was concern about getting people in and out of Woodstock because it was already a mess by that day. Yeah. And they felt that they could get me in all right. They didn't think they could get me out to fulfill this commitment the following day. So I stood at the airport with Geffen and we waved them all goodbye. And I was like the kid that couldn't go, you know. We went back up to Geffen's apartment, and I watched it, everything I could see about it on the news. And so the perspective of the song, it could never have been written had I gone, because it was really written from the perspective of a fan who couldn't go. Joni wrote plenty of sad songs, but she said that Woodstock is one of the only songs she ever wrote that made her cry when she performed it. <laughs> you were crying because you weren't there. <laughs> well, no, I was just crying because I thought, you know, I had a, maybe a naive point of view, but... <clears throat> I thought that Woodstock was, in a way, a kind of a minor miracle that people, because it was a turning point. Up until that time, hippies were really second-class citizens, and suddenly there was the beginning of a cooperation between the two generations in that town site. You know, there were a lot of good things about it. In a way, it it resembled a modern miracle to me, in a way, the way people cooperated, and that day went by. Children were born, and there was, you know, there there was a death and a birth and, and people shared and you know it was just kind of magnificent and, and I used to get very emotional about it and I suppose the, the deprivation colored the emotion too but it was a turning point it was a pinnacle it was actually the height of the hippie thing it kind of went downhill from there that same level of idealism is not as evident 16 years later on the dog eat dog album For the first time, the lyrics go pretty heavily into social issues. One song called Tax Free really skewers TV evangelists, and another song about Ethiopia describes the famine there in a very disturbing way. She said that was tricky for her. It's hard for me to take 
stances on anything. You know, um, there was a period where, you, you know, I thought, oh, dear, I don't have any opinions. I need to have opinions. I felt like I kept saying to myself, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And because culturally we consider it important to have opinions and to not know is to be stupid, I kind of panicked. In retrospect, I'd like to go back to that state of mind. <laughs> Knowing what I know about it now, that's what, something I would, you know, like to attain, but I didn't understand it at the time. Next thing I knew, I found myself to be very opinionated. Then I went through, you know, with all it and with the companies that arguments, <laughs> you know, I still am to a certain degree opinionated. One. But my opinions do tend to change. You know, they, they change with more input, thing, ideas expand. Her ambivalence didn't disappear. Later, she wrote a song called Coming from the Cold, where she clearly expresses regret about speaking out so bluntly. Maybe that's why she keeps painting. If anyone misunderstands it, they don't quote her. She still sees herself as a visual artist as much as a musician. She told one story about the time when she was living with Graham Nash and how he had to adjust to all of her creative projects. I, you know, I've always been visual. Went, went from line drawings in, I guess it was in the early 70s. Uh -huh. Graham, you know, when Graham Nash and I lived together, because I'm so compulsively creative, he... At home, in, in the way I live at home, I'm always making things, right? <laughs> so in order to live with me, you know, like if you, you, you almost have to get into something, too, <laughs> right? So he, he did some stained glass, and he finally found a voice with his camera. He bought himself a camera, uh -huh. and he was an excellent photographer. He's just really, God, he just sees things around him. He's quick that way, you know? So he said, and he... He said, oh, you have to get a camera. This was after we split up, but he insisted he bought me a really good camera. Their house was a very, very, very photographed house with two <laughs> cats in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the painting that lasted, not photography. Her paintings appear on nearly all her album covers. In fact, there's a big overlap between her visual art and her music. One of the things she told me is that she hears the instruments in her songs like colors. So if there's suddenly a wind instrument and it sounds unusual, that's Joni adding a color to her musical painting. When I met her, she had been obsessed with creating giant paintings of wolves, one of which became the cover of the Dog Eat Dog album. Well, the, the Dog Eat Dog painting was like an obsession. It wouldn't, if I laid eyes on it, it would, it would grab me and wouldn't let me you know, wouldn't let me stop working up to the point of exhaustion. And, and often during pockets of immense fatigue, the visionary aspect of it would become more intense, almost like tired to the point of hallucination. You know, it drove me like that. It so you would stay, like, up all night working on it? We'd come home from the studio some nights at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'd see it out of the corner of my eye and passing, and I'd still be at it 5 o'clock the next afternoon having not eaten, having not slept. <laughs> it wouldn't let me go, but that was probably that piece more than any other was just had... You know, That's had not the me. album cover. That was what was to me the album cover. I'm surprised she didn't get more famous as a painter. Is she in a fancy gallery? She's been in gallery shows, but she never reached the same level as she did with her music. Actually, she told me that this suited her fine. If it's too unique... They can't recognize it if it, and yet they they're screaming for innovation. They need to put you in a nice little oh, group right. so the cream can rise to the top, yeah. and they have something which they can compare. Without yeah. comparison, they can't tell whether it's any good or not. And you're not an so, East Village artist. Yeah, right. I don't have yeah. a, I don't I don't come out of a, a school. I don't think. I mean, what I've been doing is is um, looking at pictures. As I've been traveling as a musician in Europe, I've gone to the galleries to see what the museums deem to be masterpieces. I look at them. Sometimes they speak to me, and something goes into my soul. It's just the same way that, that you hear music and later. Anytime you admire something, sooner or later, something like that is going to come out in your work. I mean, I learned like that through osmosis. When The act of admiration is, is a moment of inspiration. 
simultaneously the act of admiring it, the true appreciation of it means aha a light bulb goes off a recognition of sorts and sooner or later tomorrow or two years down the road whatever it was that you loved about that is going to leak out into the work I mean, that's where the tributaries come when you listened to the interview tapes was there any other surprise that you discovered well i was more surprised by what i didn't discover one strong memory was nowhere on the tapes. It must have been during my last set of questions after the tape recorder was off. I asked Joni about the song Little Green from the Blue Album. And when I put the pieces of the puzzle together in those lyrics, it sure sounded like a song about giving up a child for adoption. So I asked her in my usual awkward way if she ever had children. She paused and said, I was never a mother which was, in a way, true, because she didn't raise her daughter. Of course, I was such a lame reporter that I didn't press her to clarify. So I never learned that she got pregnant after a short college romance and had put her daughter in a foster home before she met and married Chuck Mitchell. But when she decided to talk with the press about reuniting with her daughter, who do you think she went to? You? Well, not quite. <laughs> but she gave the story to People magazine. And I'd like to think I inspired her to trust them. Warning! Narcissism attack! You're right. We better move on. <laughs> when I got back to New York after the interview, Pat Ryan, who was the head of People, asked to see the transcript. This is someone who'd read hundreds of interviews. She went through dozens of pages and scribbled little notes in the margins. Uh, she wrote, Joni's descriptive powers are amazing. On another page, Joni described a lawyer. She said he spoke with Diamond syntax clarity, but atrophied emotionally. Pat wrote in the margin, She actually talks like this? Wow! And on the next page, when Pat noticed my lack of interview finesse, she wrote, uh, You jump around a bit, don't you? <laughs> Pat was a very <laughs> generous person. <laughs> anyway, Pat's response validated what I had witnessed with my own eyes and ears. Humans can reach a level of greatness that is beyond normal standards. I had so many expectations, and Joni exceeded all of them. She was generous, patient, humble, funny, and what a mind. Looking down at my arm now, you know, with those bumpy veins and <laughs> age spots, I keep thinking, this, this arm, this arm right here, has been in the presence of greatness. <laughs> I mean, for me, for me, it, it, it was the equivalent of spending a day with Beethoven in 1800 before they knew his music would live forever, which is very different from Joni's own assessment of herself. You know, probably the only thing that I think is extraordinary about me at all is my focus. My, you know, the thing that makes me different is that I do this work, that I have to do this work. Not everybody has that drive, okay? But... I, I'm subject to the same alterations of attention span. I know their attention span is altered because mine is, and I have to fight against it. To be a good listener, since I heard you talk a lot, I have to fight this attention span business. I assume that my desire for change and, and my discovery of, oh, I like this, therefore I will go pursue this because I'm, I'm interested. I'm drawn over here. Keeping interested in life is you know, what it's all about. If I'm interested in that, there must be a long line behind me of people or, or a line of some sort who are similarly interested. You know, on that way, because I assume I'm ordinary, I assume that what I'm interested in will be interesting to other people. Sure. I'm happy to hear that my friend had such a good bonding experience. Well, I did drive her a little crazy toward the end with my dumb questions. I was trying to get Larry to tell some good stories about being married to Joni, but I wasn't asking the question right. This is like, this is like what's that TV show? <laughs> this is your line? No, no, the one where you have husband's and wife on. Oh, right, the newlywed game. Yeah, yeah the horrible game, that's what this reminds me of. No, um... <laughs> <laughs> one thing one thing about her is that well, just... I'll get your ass for this. <laughs> she doesn't sound mad to me. I still don't understand why. After the article was published, I wrote her a thank you note for giving me so much time. I wonder if Woodward and Bernstein did that when they interviewed Deep Throat. <laughs> well, my investigative reporting was not quite so refined. 
especially since I intentionally addressed the note to Mrs. Larry Klein. I thought that was hysterically funny. But later on, I'd wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, my God, I insulted Joni Mitchell. and She was so nice to me. It wasn't the smoothest move. It was our kind of humor, Sally. But um, <laughs> I guess I should never assume that others share it. Never. Actually, it did end up okay. Five years later, I got a gig reporting on the concert of Pink Floyd's The Wall in Berlin right after the Berlin Wall fell. And it was a big celebrity event. I arrived with my press credentials to walk across the Alexanderplatz, which was still a big open field, not yet built up the way it is now. Suddenly, I hear a voice calling me, Small! It wasn't Joni Mitchell. It was. And <gasps> how do you think that made me feel? I think you probably floated right over the Brandenburg Gate. Yep, right into heaven. Did you ever see her again? I wish, but... Despite the amateurishness I've shown you today, I was mature enough to know that I wasn't really her friend. I was trying to be a sort of journalist, and in that role, I never had a good excuse to see her again. Mm. Ever since I read about her brain aneurysm in 2015 and her very difficult recovery, I've been worried about her, the way lots of people worry about her. But actually, I try not to read too much about her. If I ever met her again, which is unlikely, but still, I wouldn't want to walk in with all that baggage. So now I've got a question for you. After listening to all of this, what about you? Did I change your mind about anything? Oh, yes. To be honest, I, I thought she'd be a little haughty and, and kind of defensive in the interview. She was anything but. Joni is delightful. Who wouldn't want to meet someone like that? I know I'm supposed to diminish my worldly possessions since no one else wants them, but these four <laughs> cassettes of my interview and the transcript, sorry, Sally, I won't be tossing those. I support you. You're absolved this time. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> of course, the best thing I have from Joni, and everyone else has it too, is her art. There's so many times when it helped me get past the challenges and disappointments that happen when you hang out on this earth for a long time. On the shelf next to my desk, I keep my favorite books, and one of them is called Joni Mitchell, The Complete Poems and Lyrics. And on the inside of the book is an inscription from my mom, Doris Small. It's written two years after Cindy and I got married, before Doris's life started to go downhill from diabetes. And it says, Happy Birthday, Michael, to read to Cindy with love. Aww. I remember. Mom. Oh. And I have so many favorite lyrics, but one of them stands out. It's called Ludwig's Tune, speaking of Beethoven, and it's a song I tried to decode in my high school bedroom from the album For the Roses that you gave me, hmm. Sal. Fifty years later, it's still so powerful to me. The lyrics describe the piano as a construction of wires and trees and ivory, but the piano doesn't help the musician. The piano hides the music instead of revealing it. Just the way Beethoven's deafness made it harder for him to create music, the way every artist struggles against challenges to create their work. It's been that way for me with my writing, for Cindy with her painting, and presumably for Joni Mitchell too, during an important and productive career that one day included an interview with me. Sometimes you want to give up you think you'll never get there. You think you'll never get what you're going for. But this is how I find hope in these lyrics that Joni wrote. You've got to shake your fist at lightning now. you got to roar like a forest fire. you got to spread your light like blazes all across the sky. They're going to aim the hoses on you. Show them you won't expire. Not till you burn up every passion. Not even when you die. Come on now. You've got to try. If you're feeling contempt, well, then you tell it. If you're tired of the silent night, Jesus, well, then you yell it. Condemned to wires and hammers, strike every chord that you feel. The broken trees and elephant ivories conceal. And that's it for today. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Sally and I hope you'll tune in for the third episode of our podcast, 
which is the second installment of our Joni Mitchell extravaganza. Looking forward to it, Sally? Sure am. Yeah. This time, we'll share her longer stories with fewer interruptions from me, so you'll definitely feel (laughs) that you've heard (laughs) both sides now. (laughs) And if any of you Joni fans have not yet discovered JoniMitchell.com, please click there right now. You will find tons of info, including a gallery of Joni's paintings. I'm not invested in it. I just think it's a great site. Plus, some genius is running Joni's Facebook and Twitter accounts. They post so much interesting and rare info and videos that it's overwhelming in the best sort of way. If you're curious about the amazing Joni music that you missed in recent decades, we've made a list of her best songs since 1975. You'll find it on our website, throwitoutpodcast.com. And if you happen to use Apple Music, you can just click a link to hear the whole list. Hey, Sally, what did I leave out? How about this? If you like what you heard, please tell your friends and distant acquaintances about I Couldn't Throw It Out. You can hear every episode on our website, throwitoutpodcast.com, and any place else you get your podcasts. If you get two seconds to rate us on Apple Podcasts, we'll be your best friends forever. Whether you like it or not. (laughs) And if you want to be the first to know about future episodes of I Couldn't Throw It Out, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at throwitoutpod. I think that's it. Yes? Yes. So now we get to rock out to our theme song performed by Boots Camp, Jen Ayers, and Don Ralph, leader of the world's best rock band, Life in a Blender. More of their music can be found on our website. Ready, Sal? Ready, Mike. Here we go. Out here in Nancy's, her big garage. This isn't a mer, this isn't a mirage. Decades of stories, memories stacked. There is a redolence of some irrelevant facts. Oh, I couldn't throw it out. I had to scream and shout. It all seems so unjust. But still, I know I must. Before I turn to dust, I've got to throw it out. Before I turn to dust, I've got to throw it out. But I So through my possessions in these painful settings, I guess this is what it's about. The poems, cards, and papers, the molded musty papers, I've just gotta sort it out. Oh, I couldn't throw it out. No, I couldn't throw it out. No, I couldn't throw it out. No, 